Good afternoon. Welcome. It's really nice to have you here. I see Ricky Watkins. Hi, Ricky. And maybe Brendan is there with you. And also Terry and Randy coming from Nevada. Thank you for joining me today. I count it an honor that all of you are watching this each day. And I really appreciate your time that you're taking out of your day to spend with Nancy and I today. Today we come to Psalm 30. And it's a wonderful psalm. You'll, you'll hear some well-recognized words in it. But we're also here to pray in the midst of this pandemic. So let's begin with prayer. Kind and merciful Father, I just thank you for this day. For the, for the beauty of the weather. For the beauty of springtime and sunshine and green grass blue skies, bird song. So many beautiful things that you surround us with that all declare your glory, that are all singing your praises. Thank you for light, both for physical light and for spiritual light. Thank you for having enlightened our hearts and giving us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Father, I think we're getting war weary, pandemic weary. I know I am, Lord. I'm also weary of all the debate of course, Lord, I know I have my opinions, but Father, I pray that you would heal the divide within our churches. I pray that you would he heal the division within our churches and let us unite in one voice as citizens of a heavenly kingdom, Lord. Keep us unified in the spirit. May we Learn to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're living in a sin-sick world, Lord. And we have been sin-sick ourselves. Thank you for your remarkable redemption. Thank you for freeing us from the bondage of our sin. Thank you for freeing us from the bondage of Satan. Thank you for freeing us from the bondage of our flesh. Thank you for freeing us from the bondage of being under a perfect and holy and righteous law, which we could never keep because of our flesh. Thank you for freeing us from the bondage of death, Lord. And I give you praise for what we have to look forward to. This grand reconciliation. Where those who have gone on before us, by grace and through faith, that one day we will rush into their arms. No more goodbyes. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more mourning or grief, and no more death. Father, thank you for the reconciliation that while we were yet sinners, you reconciled us through the blood of Jesus through his death on the cross. Thank you for the amazing miracle that Jesus did on our behalf. That once reconciled, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the grace upon which we stand. Father, I pray that you would teach each one of us and those who will be listening later 
I pray that you would teach us that our only standing is your grace, that undeserved, unmerited, kind, and generous power of God to forgive, save, and transform forever our broken and sinful lives. Father, again, I pray that as I bring a message from Psalm 30, that you would give me an overwhelming filling of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray for everyone listening and watching now and later that you would fill us all with an extraordinary, extraordinary great measure of your Holy Spirit, with the fruit of the Spirit. I pray continually that you would teach us to walk in the Spirit and to be led of, led of the Spirit. I pray that you would continually teach us to hear your Spirit's voice, Lord, both through your word, but also the inward witness, that still small voice. And so, Father, I pray that you would give me words today. You would give me a clarity of mind and thought. You'd bring me to say everything I need to and keep me from saying the things I don't. I pray that you'd help me to enunciate clearly And I pray that this would be a message of grace and truth. Thank you for King David, Lord. Thank you for his life. How it models to us the reality of what it means to live in the flesh and yet to, de to depend entirely and wholly on Yahweh. And as we know, on our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for everyone listening and watching now and later that you would keep us safe, that you would keep us well, that you would meet all of our needs financially and in every other way. I pray that you would restore our souls, that you would restore our mind, will, and emotions. Thank you for this time of rest. Thank you for the hard work in the midst of this time of rest. And Father, in the end, we give you all honor, glory, and praise. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining me today. Today is our last psalm for this week. Tomorrow I'm going to be mowing lawns and getting ready for Sunday. I have a very long passage to, to uh, work on. In John, I hope you can join me. It's John chapter 4, verses, see, it would be 16 through 24. It's on the Samaritan woman at the well, one of my favorite stories. That begins at 11 a.m. on Sunday. So today we come to Psalm 30. It's also a, a Psalm of David. It's title within the Hebrew text is a psalm, a song at the dedication of the house, and we'll get there. And I'll, again, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have kept me alive that I would not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Now as for me, I said in my prosperity, I will never be moved. O Lord, be your favor, or by your favor, you have made my mountain to stand strong. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you... To you, O Lord, I called, 
and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. That my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So we begin Psalm 30, verses 1 through 12. In the Hebrew Bible, they have headings, titles that were, were given to these psalms, usually much later after, after the fact, after they had been penned. And this title is a psalm. I didn't put that in. It just says a psalm, a song at the dedication of the house. Some versions will have at the dedication of the temple, but we know the temple wasn't built until Solomon, David's son, actually built the house. And so a lot of scholars believe that it's the dedication of that tent that David erected on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem for housing the Ark of the Covenant, that they had a dedication. But the odd thing is this psalm has nothing to do with the dedication of the tabernacle or the dedication of that tent that David had for the Ark of the Covenant. It has to do with David getting sick, crying out to God because he's at the point of death from his illness, and then God delivering him and healing him, and then his praise. And so some of the people or scholars I read think that this illness interrupted the dedication. And so his healing from the dedication, his restoration, actually his healing from his illness, his restoration from being at death's door was likely incorporated into the dedication of, the, of that tent, of that house for the Ark of the Covenant, for, the, for that house for God. Again, it's a Psalm of David. So let's begin. Verse 1 of Psalm 30, I will extol you, O Lord. To extol means to lift up. And so there's this kind of wordplay going on because it's, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up. So he lifts us up, and in return, we lift him up. Let me check this. It seems like something is going on here. It's still working okay. It seems like it's running a little slow. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up, and have not let my enemies rejoice over me. So in times of illness, sometimes you find out who your friends are and who your enemies are. There was always enemies David had that would exult if he had passed away from illness. So there's this group of cheerleaders who are cheering him on in his illness, hoping that it'll take his life so then they can take over. Maybe descendants of Saul or friends of Abimelech, not Abimelech, Absalom, I always get those mixed up, Absalom, his son. And so David begins his psalm with lifting up the Lord. And again, we know that that's the name Yahweh. And from our, the New Testament enlightenment that we have received, that it's Jesus himself, I will lift you up. I will extol you, O Jesus. For you have lifted me up. Has he lifted you up in your life? He certainly has lifted up my life. You know my story. I won't go into it, but he's been so kind and so generous to me over the years, giving me a most wonderful wife, two wonderful daughters, a new mom who I love so much. He's been so very kind and generous to me in lifting my life out of, life, out of a life of drug abuse and alcoholism and perversity and debauchery. And David then again says, and have not let my enemies rejoice over me. It's the strangest thing when I got cancer, all kinds of people had opinions why I got the cancer and told me so. We won't go into them, but it was rather shocking at times. 
I had to just walk past, as we say. I know people are well-meaning. They mean to comfort you with their words, but sometimes their words are like stinging barbs, if you will. Maybe some of you have experienced the same things. David then says, O oh Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. So this is post-illness. This psalm was written after the illness, after he was healed of it. O oh Lord, O oh Yahweh, my God, O oh Yahweh, my Elohim, I cried to you for help. Have you ever been in one of those places where you cried out to God out of your tears, out of your mourning, out of your pain? Over the last two years, I've done a lot of crying out to God in the middle of the night. I cried to you for help, and you healed me. I just rest in his kindness and generosity in my life. David was healed. They didn't have the kind of doctors we have now. They didn't have the kind of, how do I say it, the wealth of physicians that we have. And so the first place David would turn would be to God for healing his illnesses. Sometimes it's the last place we turn to. Then we move on and it says, O oh Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. Again, O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol. Sheol is the place of the grave. It's the place where people go, according to new, uh, Hebrew thought. When a person died, they went to Sheol. And it wasn't a place of consciousness. It was a place of the grave. It was death. It was a place where you couldn't praise God, where you, couldn't, you, were, you were no longer aware. They did not have a well developed theology of the afterlife that came later of course they did believe in it but it wasn't a pronounced or well defined theology if you will there is progressive revelation in, in the new testament and in the old testament we have a lot more light than the hebrew people did in terms of having the new testament and so what david is saying is he, he was at the point of death this illness almost brought him to go down to Sheol, to the grave. You have kept me alive. Not the doctors, not medicine, but you have kept me alive that I would not go down to the pit. Here that pit is again a Jewish picture of a cistern, of a well. They would be very deep. And if you were thrown into a cistern like Joseph was, it wasn't just a, a 12 foot deep thing. It was a very, very deep pit. And that became an image of the grave. Once you were there, you couldn't get out. And so he's thanking God for keeping him alive and keeping him from going into death. I'm thanking God for that too today. We move on and it says, sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones. Sing praise to the Lord. So his remedy to having been sick and now recovered is to turn and to praise God for what he's done for him. Sing praise to Yahweh. Sing praise to Jesus. You, his godly ones. Those who would be defined, the godly, godly ones would be defined as those who were keepers of the law. Keepers of the covenant that God had made with the Israelite people through Abraham, renewed it through Isaac and Jacob, made it clear through Moses with the giving of the terms of the covenant, the law. So he was calling on the people of Israel who were actually under the covenant, following the covenant, attempting to keep the tenets of the law. He was calling on them to praise God for what God has, had done for him and give thanks to his holy name. It's interesting, but it really doesn't say name here. And it says literally, and, and give thanks to his holiness. It sounds like giving thanks to the Pope. That's not what it means. And give thanks to his holiness. You could, you could render it and give thanks for his holiness, that he is high and set apart, that he is 
perfectly righteous in his own being. No sin, no deception, no duplicity, no being two-faced, never being a promise breaker, always being a promise keeper. And so even in the midst of illness sometimes, it's good just to praise God, to get our eyes on his goodness, his power, his ability to heal. Then we move on. Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. And so this gets into a weird theology that is still with us today. And in part, the theology is correct, but hear me out. In that day, if you got sick, they believed it was because there was sin in your life. And so all illness was traced to sin. And, and in one sense, that is true because of the fall. I don't think illness was present before the fall. I'm sure of it. But after the fall, illness was brought in through the consequences of the fall. And so David interprets his illness as God being angry at him. And maybe he was, and we'll find out, he was keenly aware of what that sin was. It wasn't this vague sense of, man, I've done something wrong and God is angry at me and that's why I'm sick. I wondered that about my cancer. Is it because of some sin in my life that he allowed me to get cancer? I've asked him. There's always that general sense of that sin is in, or illness is in the world because of sin. But when I asked him why I have cancer, all he said was, trust me, Grant. Well, actually, he said, I love you, Grant. Just trust me. We know in the New, New Testament that the disciples shared that same belief that all illness was caused by sin. And so you have the story of the man born blind. And the disciples asked Jesus, so who sinned, his parents or he, while he was yet in his mother's womb, was a sense that he, he was born blind. And Jesus says it was neither because his parents sinned nor because of his sin. But this happened to him so that the glory of God might be revealed through him as Jesus heals him. I'm glad for that text because it takes illness out of that category and out of that thinking. Yes, we live in a fallen world. Yes, there is illness because of the, the fall, because the creation is groaning. And there are illnesses that are directly related to our sin. That's true. But it's quite clear now that all illness isn't caused by our sin. Look at the, the thorn that Paul had. It was a thorn in the flesh, and so we believe it was some kind of illness he had. And he cried out to God three times, remove this from me. And Jesus spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. We tend to say that that text, which is clear, is an exception to our theology because it's an exception to our theology, even though it's in there. For his anger is but for a moment. So God has been angry at David, allowed him to get sick. His favor is for a lifetime. And in the New Testament, that word favor is translated as grace. His grace is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning when you've survived the night, when you've survived a particularly rough, rough night. I know, I know some of you have been through this. I know about weeping in the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning, a new day. His compassions are new every day, every morning. So it's kind of this weird theology that is still with us. I know a colleague told me, I just hate sin. When he found out about my cancer, he says, I just hate sin. And I don't know if the implication was because of that general sense of sin causing illness in the whole whole world or if he was saying grant i think there's some sin in your life 
I know there's sin in my life. There's always been sin in my life. And I know that there's sin in your life. There's always been sin in your life. Let's be honest here. If I'm to stand on my work and my ability to live a sin-free life, I am toast. And so are you. I'm looking forward to that shout of joy that comes in the morning of a brand new dawn, of a brand new day when I will wake up breathing an ethereal air. But a shout of joy comes in the morning. Then we get to Psalm 30, verse 6. And it says, Now as for me, I said in my prosperity, I will never be moved. Now we get to the sin that he believes caused was the cause of God allowing him to get sick. Now as for me, I said in my prosperity, I will never be moved. What's that sound like? What sin is that? It's a sin that torments all of us, that clings closer than mud to all of us, that soils all of our lives, and that's the sin of pride. And so I want to take an excursion here and just kind of depart from Psalm 30 for a moment. I like these excursions. Sometimes they're the real Bible study, but it incorporates so wonderfully into this psalm and what David is struggling with. Is it my pride? Is that why I have cancer? Because I, I know I've struggled with pride all my life. And honestly, I still struggle with pride. I pray against it every time before I speak, before I do a Bible study. That ugly voice of pride is part of my flesh. And one day this flesh will die and I will be free of that pride forever. But thanks be to God that we are free now because of the shed blood of Jesus and his cross. So I want to take an excursion into looking at pride from the, new, from the perspective of both the Hebrew Scriptures but also the, the New Covenant. I think about David's son, Solomon. He had grown up in David's household. He knew both that David was a, hard after, or a man after God's own heart, but he had also seen up close and personal David's sin. He wasn't around with Beersheba, of course, because he was born to, uh, not Bathsheba, I mean, Beersheba's a city. My brain is not wired correctly anymore. But he would have known the stories, I think, and he would have seen the consequences of that with Absalom. He knew his father's pride, and he would become fully aware of his own pride. In his life. And so Solomon said these words in Proverbs 16, 18. We, we quote these quite often. I thought this was, was in the New Testament. It's not. It's in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Scriptures. Pride goeth, goes before destruction. Or as the King James would have it, the, the one we always quote, pride goeth before a fall. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Now, we know that was true of people under the Old Covenant, but is it true of us as well in the New Covenant? Of course. Pride is a disturbingly destructive force. Pride went before David's destruction, his potential destruction. I will not be moved. He was being completely self-reliant not God-reliant, not Yahweh-reliant. His being king had gotten, gone to his head. Sometimes my being pastor goes to my head. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. So I want to jump ahead to the New Testament, then we're going to go back to the Hebrew Scriptures, then back to the New Testament again. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, we read these words. This is John, likely at the end of his life, writing from Patmos. The very end of his life, at the end, very end of living a life of faith and a life of struggle. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. 
I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. That's a word for us today. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. There's a lot of things in this world that I have come to love. Not just talking about human beings, it's not talking about that, but the things of the world, the sins of the world, the ways of the world, the course of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And John is speaking of this ideal, of this perfect person, which none of us can, can uh, achieve in of ourselves. But when we are in love with the world, at that point in time, the love of the Father is not in us. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father. Those words are taken from Genesis chapter 3. We'll get there in a moment, but just let me reiterate. For all that is in the world, all that is in the world, do you see that? Everything that is in the world, the lusts of the flesh, this would be sexual desire, desire for addiction, the desire for alcohol and drugs, the desire for, all, for pleasure, for gluttony, for all those kinds of fleshly sins, the lusts of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, those things that we look at and go, whoa, that can quickly spill over into the lust of the flesh. But it would be things like things that we see that are good in the world that indeed are not good. I think about drinking. We watch a number of shows on Netflix, and one of the ones I really liked was Blue Blood. Blue Blood, about the, I think it's Tom Selleck starring as the chief of police for the city of New York. I got to tell you, there's one part of that show I don't like. Every time they turn around, they're drinking. Literally, morning, noon, dinner, evening, they're always drinking, and it always makes it look so glamorous. I've been sitting around in a table at AA with anywhere from 6 to 30 people. And around that table, alcoholism does not look glamorous at all. And the lust of the eyes, it looks good because it's glamorous. It looks good because it's cool. And then the boastful pride of life that touches all of our lives. I'm so humble. I'm the most humble guy you'll ever meet in the world. So oftentimes our pride is masks, masked through our self-conception of, of ourselves, of how we see ourselves, that we look at ourselves better than we ought and look at others as less than us. Those three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So some might bring in the law here and say, that's the will of God. No, no, this is John. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. For we have all received of his fullness grace in place of grace. No, what's the will of God? If you go to chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 22 or 23, it says, this is his commandment that we believe in in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The only way I know how to love one another is to be full of his spirit. That's John chapter 15. You can read through that. See that the fruit being spoken of there is love. That's where Jesus gives that command initially. Love one another as I have loved you. But in John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much, much fruit, the fruit of love, in the chapter. For apart from me, you can do 
nothing and we think that we can be loving, nothing further from the truth. We love ourselves. I had a friend in Evergreen who said one of the most remarkable things in class. He was kind of a strange guy. From one side, he had long hair that came down to his shoulders, long, very straight hair. And on the other side, it was cut like a businessman's cut. And it, it kind of merged in the back, kind of tapered in the back. So if you were sitting on this side of him, he looked like a businessman. If you sat on this side of him, he looked like maybe a 60s hippie. And he said, you know, it's not so much that we fall in love with people, but that we fall in love with their image of us. Been there, done that. That's that pride of life. So you see those three things, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. So then I go back to Genesis to where those are found. John was taking those three concepts from the fall. And so we read in Genesis chapter 3, this is after Adam and Eve have been created, after they have been enjoying God's presence in the garden, after they had been enjoying eating of the fruit of every tree in the garden, Save the, of, save the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they hadn't eaten from the tree of life yet. They could have, but they hadn't. And we read, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. We know from Revelation, this is speaking of, of Satan, whether Satan possessed this animal is the likely thing. And so we know that this serpent is actually Satan. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. That's what Satan does. He always twists God, God's word. Notice what he says. Indeed has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. What God said, you shall not eat from one tree of the garden. Only one tree you can't eat from. You can eat from everything else. But that's how Satan always begins. He twists God's word just a little bit. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has God has says, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So he always, he, Satan already has Eve on this downward spiral of, dis, spiral of deception. Because notice what she does. It's true that God said you cannot eat from this tree. But she says, don't touch it either or you will die. God never said that. That's her addition. So Satan twists by adulterating what God says. We twist by adding things on to what God says. We do it all the time. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Now there's the bold-faced lie. The lie of lies. You surely will not die. Did they die? Both Adam and Eve died. God's word was true. If they ate of that tree, they would die. Satan continues, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You don't need God. You can do it yourself. You can be God unto yourself. And that lie has infiltrated our thinking in every aspect of our cultures. Even of our churches, we let this lie creep into our churches and into our religion, if you will. And here we have those three concepts, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh, that, and that it was a delight to the eyes. There's a lot of things that are delights to the eyes that aren't good. That's the uh, lust of the eyes. And the tree was desir desirable to make one wise, the boastful pride of life. She took from its fruit and ate. And I'm thinking, oh, Eve, why did you do that? But notice this, we blame Eve. And she gave, all, gave also to her husband with her and he ate. So he was standing there along, all along, didn't say a word. He could have said, Eve, I don't think that's a good idea. Don't you remember what God told us? Or he could have corrected Eve. He didn't say touch it, he just said, but he just stands silently by this passive husband. 
and she also gave and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked notice that the first thing they realized that they were without clothing and that would be a sense of shame had now come over their lives they introduced shame into the world and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So right at the top, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here we have the lie that has plagued our world to this day. And so if I jump ahead now to Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through I think it's 24, we read these words, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So he's talking about this general wet revelation that if you look at the heavens and look at the stars and look at the planets and the sun, it speaks out about who God is. And it also says that God, because that which is known about God is evident within them. So there's an inward witness of our con conscience, our inward witness that God has an inward witness that God has placed there. that we know he exists. Every human being on the planet actually knows he exists because God has put it within them. And then all of creation sings out his glory, the flowers, the trees, the mountains, the birds, the animals. We human beings even in our fallen state still reflect the glory of God and because we were made in his image. The whole world lies without excuse, according to Paul in Romans 1. And then we continue and it says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Because of that being like God, they wanted to be like God. They wanted to, we all wanted to honor ourselves. They did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Notice what, where that happens. It's in their mind, in their speculations. Speculations are always dangerous. I always warn people in Bible study, be careful of speculating. Don't build your theology on speculation. Don't build your understanding of God on speculation. And their foolish heart, which to a Hebrew people, that was mind, much more so than our emotions, their heart was darkened. Per professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So it's talking about idolatry here. I lived in Japan, one of the most idolatrous nations in the world. Everywhere you go, there's idols. Down on the street, there's jizo, these little stone idols for children and parents with, sick, sick, with children who are sick will bring their children's clothing and clothe these stone idols and then make an offering of rice and wine and maybe some meat of, of some, some kind. Then they will come back every day and replace the offering in hopes that this stone God will heal their child. We exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corrupt, corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. We worshiped the creation instead of the creator. And we are no different in this society, as I've said many times, our, our idol is self, the worship of self. And then we conclude in Romans with these words, and this is where I'm driving at. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Do you realize that all these sins that our world is getting into isn't because that's the first cause. 
No, the first cause is that we gave up worshiping God and started worshiping things and creatures and started worshiping ourselves. And then here it is. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's the human condition. That's the condition that has been with us since Adam and Eve took of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil and ate. And we became like God, knowing good and evil. We thought we were God. Notice what it actually says. It says, for they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And then it tells us what that lie is. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So if you think back to Genesis chapter 3, what Adam and Eve did was they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and they worshiped themselves because they wanted to become like God. I said it's infiltrated every part of our cultures, our societies, our institutions, and even our churches and our religion. We have thought we could have a righteousness of our own making that would be acceptable to God. We thought that we could produce a devotional life out of our own strength and flesh that would be acceptable to God. We thought that we could do works that would be acceptable to God. We thought that we could love like God, and even though he tells us, apart from me, you can do nothing. Hmm. Every generation is... One of my favorite teachers, Malcolm Smith, says, every generation has watched their parents fail in making the lie work. Trying to live by a lie never works. But every generation picks up the lie, dusts it off, and says, oh, our parents failed at it, but we'll show our parents. We'll show. We'll show them that we can do what they failed at. It's impossible to live a lie. And right now, our culture, our United States, is given wholly over to the worship of self. Just believe in yourself. And so it's not a wonder that we're given, being given over into all these degrading passions. Not just one degrading passions, a multitude of, of degrading passions. It beggars my imagination sometimes. It beggars my mind to think about where this culture is going. Things like Super Bowl Sunday becomes the number one sex trafficking day in that city. They, they import underage girls. Hor horrific stuff. We kick God out of everything in our society. Most recently, we kicked him out of marriage, and that's only going to get worse. All because we're worshiping self. And the consequences of that worship is always death. You and I cannot produce a righteousness that is acceptable to God. You and I cannot produce a devotional life from our side that is acceptable to God. You and I can't do anything. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming up from ourselves, our adequacy is, God, is from God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that this transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. Or Jesus' words, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, she who abides in me and I in her, she it is that bears much fruit. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. All we were ever supposed to be were creatures, not God. We were never meant to pursue having our own righteousness. Everything was to come from God. Everything was to be supplied from him. Everything was to be supplied from him. But there's this tenacious lie that we believe. I can do it, Lord. It was on the lips of James and John when they asked to be at 
the left hand and right hand of Jesus when he comes in, into his kingdom, not realizing that they were asking to die with him on the cross. And they said, and Jesus asked them, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said, yes, we are able. You remember that song? I don't like singing that song. Um, I know I'm, I'm wholly in, unable, incapable. If you get, if the Spirit is allowing you to understand what I'm saying, this leads us to a place of rest because we realize that everything is of God and not of me. And then I bounce over to James 4, verses 4 through 7, and we have words that are very similar to 1 John. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility with God? I wish that our church could learn this today. We are making such friendship with the world in so many ways. In more ways than we imagine. Therefore, whoever wishes to, to, a friend, to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We've been making friends, friends with the world for a long time. Or do you not think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires a spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Elsewhere in Ephesians, I think it's chapter 4, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. I think we grieve him all the time when we live in self-reliance, when we look for self-esteem instead of Christ's esteem, the esteem that Christ has for us. And in return, because we love, because he first loved us, our esteem for Jesus is always secondary to his love for us. He jealously desires the spirit which he made to dwell in us. If we have the spirit in us and we're pursuing the things of the world, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And it brings our Father, our God, into a state of jealousy. But he gives a greater grace. I love that. But he gives a greater grace than what the world can give. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, you know those people. I'm the most humble guy you've ever met. That's not the humility he's talking about. The humility he's talking about is to recognize our state. To recognize that we are not God, that I cannot produce anything, that you cannot produce anything on your own. That our righteousness is as filthy rags, and literally that's as menstrual rags. From Isaiah, I think it's 64. Even our good things are like bloody rags, which were seen as the utmost of uncleanliness in that day. And then he gives us the remedy. Submit, therefore, to God. Submit, therefore, to God. Take yourself off the throne in every part of your life, in your pursuing righteousness, even in your pursuing good works. Let him be the one who weaves into the tapestry of your day the good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 Even the good works our product of his grace, our fruit of his grace, our fruit of his spirit. And so we, we are to submit ourselves to God, to surrender to God. We're to resist the devil in his temptation to think more highly of ourselves, to think in terms of that boastful pride of life. I struggle with this every day. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so it's not promising I'm never going to be prideful again. I cannot make that promise, and I know that you cannot make that promise. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Turn your eyes to God and let him be God, is what it's saying. Surrender to him. Surrender to the Holy Spirit. Surrender to our Lord Jesus Christ. Where in our lives have we swallowed the lie? Where in your life have you swallowed that lie that I can do it, Lord? You're going to be pleased with me. How many times have we promised I'll never do that again? 
And by the end of the day or by the end of the week, we've done it again. And then we say, oh, Lord, please forgive me. I promise I'll never do that again. That's believing the lie, believing that you have the capacity to change your life. No. Remember those words, now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. But we all with unveiled face, as beholding the, the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is a spirit. That transformation in our life comes from the Holy Spirit, not from ourselves. We, learn, we need to learn to be creatures. We need to learn to be earthen vessels, and that's it looking to him for every part of our life. He is my righteousness. He is my sanctification. He is your righteousness. He is your sanctification. Even he is your devotional life. So there's that New Testament view on pride. Are we forgiven? Yes. But are there consequences to pride? Yeah. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride goes before destruction. So we come back to our psalm. Now as for me, I said in my prosperity, I will never be moved. There's that boastful proud pride of life. There's that God, David taking himself seriously as a little God. He doesn't need God. I will never be moved. Can you say that about your life? You will never be moved? I can't say that. Right now, I'm living in the river of his Holy Spirit. Just relinquish yourself to the Holy Spirit. And those wild river currents, which are the Holy Spirit, who are the Holy Spirit, will carry us wherever the river currents go. Now, as for me, I said in my prosperity, he was getting really wealthy. Things were growing great for him. He was now enthroned as king. I will never be moved. Pride had overtaken his life. But then look at what he says. O Lord, by your favor you have made my mountain to stand strong. He recognizes the truth. It's not by himself. It's by God's grace that he has made David's mountain. And what is David's mountain? Mount Moriah, the city upon which Jerusalem is built. We call it the city of David. For this very reason, he's saying that, O Lord, by your favor, you have made my city, my mountain, to stand strong. You have kept me from illness. You have risen. You have raised me back up to life. You hid your face. I was dismayed. In his pride, God hid his face from David. And I think for us, are there still consequences to our pride? Pride still goes before destruction. It still goes before the fall. God is opposed to, the, to, the proud, to those who are in pride, but gives grace to the humble. You hid your face. I was dismayed in his illness. To you, to you, O Lord, I called, and to the Lord I made supplication. To you, Yahweh, I called. To you, Jesus, I call now, and to the Lord I make supplication. Please, don't let me live out of a resource of pride. Don't let me live out of the resource of self-reliance, self-aggrandizement, self-fulfillment, self-esteem. Keep my eyes riveted on you. Keep our eyes riveted on you. Don't let anybody watching or hearing fall to the lie in our life that we can produce anything acceptable to you. It all comes from you. It all comes from the Holy Spirit, Lord. What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? If, if you let me die from this illness, Lord, I will no longer be praising you. Will the dust praise you? They didn't have a developed afterlife, thought of an afterlife. When you die, your body disintegrates, it's turned into dust. Will the dust of this body, will the ashes of my body be praising God? Will it declare your faithfulness to keep your promises? to keep God's promises? Well, we know with further revelation in the New Testament that to be absent from the body is to be home with the Lord for those who have come to believe in him, who have been born of his spirit. 
I know the moment I take my last breath will be the moment I meet Jesus and I will be home with the Lord. But my body, my flesh will be cremated and then put in the ground in Tacoma, the new Tacoma Cemetery. We have a greater light. David's saying, don't let me die because if you let me die, that's it. I'm not going to be able to praise you anymore. Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. What wonderful prayer. What a wonderful prayer for this time in our pandemic. Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. I know how fickle I am. We know how fickle we are. We now know how quickly we can fall back into pride. Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. Hear, O Lord, give me your grace today. O Lord, be my helper, be my strength, be my shield, be my everything. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. So David is saying that he was his illness was cured. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. When they were sometimes in illness or mourning, they would clothe them, themselves with that very rough, rough cloth of sackcloth. You see sackcloth when you get a big bag of potatoes and there's that brown, very rough cloth, that sackcloth. And you have girded me with gladness. David has come through the illness singing praises. And I'm going to come through this illness singing praises. And you're going to come through your illnesses singing praises. But in the eternal scope of things, it will be whether by death or by life. There's one day he's going to turn my mourning into dancing. And the sackcloth of this life will be removed and we will be girded with gladness. Why do we put so much stock in this world? Well, we get back to we've become lovers of the world. I rest in God's unchanging grace. And then lastly, that my soul may sing praise to you and may not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Notice what he says here now. He will give thanks to God, to Yahweh forever. And so here's that sense of the afterlife. One day, we're all going to die unless the Lord comes back while we're still living. But if he doesn't return, then every one of us is going to taste of death. But because of the shed blood of Jesus, because of his taking all of our sin, including the sin of our pride, upon his body, all of that sin died with him and we've been completely forgiven. We've been wholly pardoned. If we would but turn to Jesus and call out to him, save me, Jesus. As a thief on the cross called out, as I pointed out on Sunday, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response on the cross, truly, truly, I say to you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Today you shall be with me in paradise. That my soul may sing praise to you. He is God. He alone is good. He alone is worthy. He alone is perfect kindness and graciousness and unconditional love and the God of all comfort. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. O Lord our God, we will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Psalm 30, I love some of those words. What a beautiful psalm. But it's a psalm about confronting our pride. We can ask the Holy Spirit to put it to death. I've been asking that for years. I think it's a long process. Let's pray. Father, just to thank you for the, today. I thank you for everyone gathered, for those who stuck it out and listened. Pray for those who will yet listen that you would speak to our hearts. 
Thank you that you are God and we are but creatures. We do not have to pretend that we are God. We do not have to pr pretend to try to be God. We do not have to pretend to try to create our own righteousness. Everything is from your hand. We have this treasure of the ministry of the Spirit. We have this treasure of the indwelling Christ in earthen vessels, in clay pots, in cracked pots. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that we, so that the transcendent power, so that the transcendent power may be of you and not of us. We are afflicted in every, in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may be, may be manifested in our bodies. Thank you for that death of Jesus reigning in our lives. Thank you that we are but earthen vessels, that you are God, and we are but made of clay creatures. Help us to learn the truths of this psalm and the truth of the scriptures covered today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thanks for coming today. I hope to see you on Sunday at at 11 if you can join us. Hope you have a wonderful day. Stay, stay safe and well. Our blessing today is found from Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.